Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everybody. Um, so, yeah, my, my, uh, my goal today, of course, is to explain uh, how the semantically generated metadata can uh, take part of this process. Um, so, one, uh, one quick slide on, uh, on Temis. So, I'm Guillaume Mazia. I run uh, Temis in the US, and I'm in charge of worldwide publishers as well. Uh, we are known as uh, the leader in uh, semantic content enrichment, which uh, <coughs> means that we can add more metadata uh, to the content. Uh, we are considered a pure player. I mean, really, we are extremely uh, narrowly focused on this specific area, the semantic metadata. Uh, so we play well with others, and we have, uh, of course, a very good relationship with the uh, really strategies. And uh, as you know, uh, Highwire <coughs> is also using the Temis technology to provide uh, semantic enrichment services to, uh, to their uh, customers. Uh, the product itself, so the company is Temis, the product itself is uh, Luxid, Luxid for Content Enrichment Platform, it's, uh, it's a big name. Uh, it has won many awards in the past, and uh, most recently it won the award for the best semantic enrichment solution, uh, the Cody Award. So I was, I was extremely uh, proud of it myself, uh, but I think what uh, made me the proudest is just the fact that the Cody Award had for the first time this year a category for semantic enrichment. I mean, before we tried to compete in CMS, search engine, knowledge management, it was never the right category for us. So finally, I mean, I think semantic enrichment is known as, as a, a technology. And uh, of course, I mean, publishers have been early adopters of semantic enrichment, but we see a huge uptake in the enterprise world as well. So it is, it is happening. As you can see, we work with many different publishers. Uh, we are known for our work with very large publishers, so the Elsevier, Springer, uh, Thomson, Wiley of the Worlds, but there's more. I mean, more and more we work with uh, society uh, publishers, with uh, smaller STM, medical, um, humanities, social science publisher. Uh, so many different domains as well, engineering, of course. Uh, and this is, this is worldwide. I mean, we originated uh, the company in, uh, in Europe, in France, then mm -hmm. we expanded in the UK, uh, in Germany, Southern Europe, and uh, now, of course, uh, in the US. And uh, I am myself based in, uh, in the US, and my team is, uh, is in New York. OK, moving on. So the semantic uh, metadata, I mean, this, uh, this is really why, uh, why you should add uh, semantic metadata to the content, so the key, uh, the key benefits. So the first benefit is that it will make the search engine on your web properties more efficient. If you feed a search engine with rich metadata, you can do a few different things. The first one is faceted search, because you can use the taxonomy to help the readers uh, navigate, to drill down, and access to a specific subset of content. Uh, it will, of course, increase the precision of the search engine, as well as the recall, because you don't really rely on keywords anymore, but you rely on entities that we have extracted from the text, so the search engine will be, uh, will be more efficient. You will boost uh, the, uh, the inside, because it's, it's um, you will be able to deliver um, information in context in a specific uh, user environment. So this notion of, of API-driven content delivery, I think, is key. If you have the right metadata, you can deliver the information directly into the end user workflow. So we see a big push of that. Whether it's a nurse doing a specific uh, procedure, she can have relevant content for a specific, uh, a specific, uh, specific um, knowledge uh, that she needs. It's the same for the lawyers. It's the same for traders. So this notion that they don't come and get the content from you, but you need to push the content to them, I think is, is, uh, is very important. And of course, this is enabled if you have, I mean, first, the right understanding of the user workflow, number one, and number two, the right metadata to match uh, the content and uh, the end user workflow, of course. Uh, this idea as well that the metadata can help you slice and dice the content is key. I mean, we hear from the customers uh, that a key benefit is the content repurposing or content reuse. If you take a slice of your content and push it towards the topic page, that's very interesting as well. So think in terms of content reuse as well. The more metadata you have, the more agility you gain in the way you can reuse the content and repurpose the content across, uh, I mean, the typical silos of books and, uh, and uh, journals. So I have only one, uh, ooh, OK, the, <laughs> the presentation has um, kind of uh, disappeared, but that's OK. Let me build the slides, OK. So this is one, I mean, the only uh, kind of technical slide, but I know, I know uh, 
you had an interest, of course, in um, understanding what's, uh, what's happening under the hood, because there is a lot of analysis to, to make sure that we give you the right uh, semantic metadata. So that's the only one, and I'll spend only, uh, only one minute on this one. But if you take one sentence, I mean, typically this uh, sentence here, um, which, which you don't see very well, but le you can look at it on the top. I mean, there is, there is a specific condition on a specific type of patient, right, caused by something we look, which uh, looks like, uh, like a drug. The first analysis, which is really the linguistic analysis, I mean, semantic technology is a, a kind of new name, but uh, uh, the previous name was natural language processing. So, I mean, this, there is a lot of natural language processing happening under the hood. We'll give you, we'll group the different terms of each sentence into specific tokens, so like the tokenization, and then we'll give them a syntactic role. That's the part of speech tagging. So the system understands that there is a noun, there is a pronoun, there is a verb, so the system understands the grammar and the pattern of the sentence in many different languages, including in this case, of course, English, uh, but, but more, more than that. So once you have that, I mean, this is exactly what we do when we read, right? But I mean, we do it extremely quickly, uh, and, and it's, it's totally intuitive, of course, when we do it. But the system knows uh, how to interpret the terms and the grammar to derive the meaning. So that's, that's key. Once you have that, you can extract entities and relationship. So entities are really, I mean, the key nuggets of knowledge within the, the sentence. In this case, we have a patient, we have a symptom, we have a drug name. Uh, when you extract entities, you want to normalize the entities as well. Carbamazepine and CBZ, it's the same thing. So the system is able to resolve this, uh, this uh, uh, potential um, ambiguity and is able to, uh, to discover the acronyms. That's a key uh, normalization and, uh, and ambiguity resolution is a key part of semantic tagging. I mean, we won't get into too many details today, but that's, that's really uh, what delivers good quality uh, tags. And then finally, once you have uh, the entities, you can derive the relationships. And that's really where it gets very semantic. I mean, I would call the first phases linguistic analysis, and the other one is semantic. And uh, when, when Craig will, uh, will explain how you use that, basically, if you have a couple of entities linked by a relationship, well, you have, you have a triple. You have a subject, object, predicate. And once you have a triple, you can feed a database or a triple store. And once you have that, you can do very sophisticated queries, analytics on top of it. So that's why it gets really interesting. Uh, from unstructured content to structured content. And uh, once you have this structured content, you're not on the, uh, on the text anymore, you're on data. So you can have data-driven products more than content-driven products. So I tried here to, um, to group uh, the key areas of value. Uh, and this is really based on the conversation we have every day with, uh, with, uh, with the customers. It's always work in progress. I mean, this took me a, a big uh, chunk of the flight from, from New York to uh, San Francisco to, to build. <laughs> so I'm very happy if you give me more, uh, more input, of course. Yeah, it took a while. The guy next to me was a little bit wondering what I was trying to achieve. But uh, <laughs> I told him, I'll tell you once the slide is done. And of course, when I walked out of the plane, was st the slide was still, uh, still working for us. So anyway, the first, I mean, I tried to, to divide the three main areas of value, and, uh, and I found that they, they fall into three main categories. The first one is the content will be more compelling, right? I mean, you'll have a better and uh, engaging relationship with, uh, with the readers. So search engine optimization, which I think is key for all of you. I won't spend too much time on this because this is a huge topic. Uh, maybe Craig will, will spend a little bit of time on this. But basically, I mean, I think the takeaway uh, for today is that if you have the right tags and you know how to expose those tags with the right uh, ID, with the right uh, uh, identificator to the Googles, the Bing, and the Yahoo, I mean, of course, this will boost and this will optimize uh, the ability of your content to be found uh, on the web. So that's a key uh, benefit of, um, of the semantic arrangement, of course. Those tags which you use for the search engine are not necessarily the tags that you use for the faceted search, right? I mean, you have things uh, which your documents carry which are hidden. So you have tags for different purposes. That's something to, to keep in mind as well. Faceted search is always, I mean, what we hear usually first from the customers. I have a taxonomy. I want to automate the tagging of my content with the taxonomy to, uh, to enable um, drilling down and finding a more uh, targeted subset of content. Uh, the linking is key as well, uh, linking across journals, within journals, book chapters and journals, reference works, etc. So linking, uh, I mean, inward and, uh, and uh, outward. Recommendation, of course, more like this uh, type of feature. If you're running this, then uh, this content is uh, semantically similar, so maybe you'd be interested in reading this one. Uh, 
Uh, personalization as well is a huge topic, how you take a slice of your content and you make it very targeted to a specific audience or even to a specific individual. Uh, so of course, I mean, if you have the right types, you can be extremely precise when you, when you do that. So from broad and shallow product to targeted and, uh, and narrow product. So this is a way to enhance uh, the existing product. If you look at what's in the, uh, in the red part, it's the new products, right, that you can derive uh, from, uh, from the metadata. So the first are, are, are topic pages, which uh, we, we touched on uh, briefly. If you take a slice of your content and, and uh, automatically push this into a topic page, of course, it's great for the search and optimization, and it's great because you have a specific uh, page for a specific, a specific audience. Knowledge bases, when we saw the triple uh, earlier, if we keep the same example, if you want to extract from uh, medical journals all the potential side effects, and then you want to build a knowledge base of side effect, I mean, that's typically where you have a um, content uh, product that becomes data uh, product. We've covered API-driven delivery and semantic advertising, which I understand is not necessarily a huge uh, topic for you, but in some cases um, it is. And I'll show you an example where we have a, a benefit in semantic advertising. For our customers in the media space or in newspaper, this is really extremely important, as important as uh, SEO. It's very easy. You take uh, the, the tags or the descriptors of the ads. You try to match them with the semantic fingerprint of a specific topic page or a specific article. And it means that your click-through rate will be much better. And so the way you can monetize the content will be much better as well. Very simple, very efficient and a good, uh, a good benefit. And I would say the third one is maybe the one which is the, uh, the easiest uh, to explain and maybe the easiest uh, to sell as well internally to, to a CFO, to a CEO, or to a publisher, right? Because this is the automation, and they love the automation, of course. So if you rely on a team of indexers, and if, I mean, the trend, I think, is not to increase those teams, uh, but rather to make them more efficient, uh, if you rely on uh, outsourcing companies who take your content and enrich its content as well, which is um, useful, but of course, in terms of scalability, uh, in terms of consistency, quality, uh, th there are some concerns, of course. Uh, this notion that you can automate the tagging, automate the categorization of the content, in some cases, maybe uh, suggest the best peer reviewer for a specific, uh, specific article, is of, course, uh, is of course a key. So, I mean, the way I, I think about this is always in terms of cost saving, but what I hear from the customer sometimes is a little bit different. Consistency. Comes, 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 I mean, all the time, because of course, if you have an automated process, it's more, it's more consistent, it's more predictable, you can fine tune. And it's of course uh, this notion that you can use the subject matter expert, the knowledge of your indexers, to make the system more uh, relevant, right? So it's not the system against the, the people, it's really not at all how you should, uh, you should uh, present that and understand that, but at the contrary, the indexers will have a great knowledge of the content, uh, I mean, have a role to play to enhance the, the quality of the uh, of the system itself. There is one more thing which is um, which is key. It's this uh, notion of machine learning. If you have content which has been tagged, it's good news because we can learn from that. So the system, a, a good semantic system, has the ability to learn from content which has been tagged. I mean, it needs to be good content tagged in the way you want it to be tagged, of course. And the system can learn and then re replicate, derive a model. Uh, to replicate the tagging and automate the tagging as well. So if you have a taxonomy which has been used to tag past content, that's something which is extremely critical to enhance the quality of those uh, systems. So examples now, I picked uh, three examples. Uh, the first one is from, um, the first one is from uh, Springer Link. So of course you know, uh, you know this is the new version of uh, Springer Link by the way, it has changed a few, uh, a few months ago. Uh, so, I mean, a very, very broad um, uh, set of uh, content. Uh, Springer doesn't own and they don't want to have a taxonomy, which I think is, uh, is interesting. So they really rely on our technology to add fingerprints uh, for the documents and they power some interesting semantic, uh, semantic features. I think this one here is interesting. For any given abstract, you have uh, related content. So this one is on uh, trade liberalization and the, the impact on pollution. Uh, so if you look uh, at one more article here, you <coughs> click there, you go to trend liberalization, and then you have, again, more related content. So the goal, of course, is always to suggest a next step, right? That's, that's, that's the idea. So if you read any abstract, 
The next step can be to look at rated content. In some cases, the suggestions, the links, are maybe more, interested, more interesting than the one you're looking at. So you will click on this one. <coughs> in terms of uh, commercial benefits, those uh, abstracts or book chapters are for sale. So there is this, this notion of transactional mm -hmm. revenue. Uh, if you have an institution or corporate uh, subscription, some of the suggestion will be beyond the paywall. So you will, you'll be asked to, to pay if you want to use it. Or if you have access, uh, I mean, for the customers who have a very broad access, uh, it's, it's a lower cost per download because they will just consume more, uh, more of the Springer content. So the benefits are interesting. We had some stats. It's not very often that we have uh, uh, stats and metrics. And um, they had a boost when they, they released that by 20% uh, of, uh, of usage. And uh, I think 50% uh, of the readers for the first month use this uh, feature of related uh, content, which I think was, uh, was interesting. We'll take questions uh, at the end, of course. One other example from uh, Nature, Nature Publishing Group, which I think is, uh, I mean, takes it one, uh, one step further. Uh, it relates a bit more to what uh, Sarah has, uh, has described because it's the, the same type of content as well. Uh, in this case, it's, it's, I mean, the content is very specific for a specific audience. So you know that the readers here are, are biologists or clinical biologists, and you have these new tools, which is the highlighting tool with compounds and genes and proteins. So if you click on genes and proteins, you highlight all the genes and the proteins that the system has extracted from, uh, from the content. So for the biologist, of course, it's a great tool because before you even read, uh, you know which genes and proteins will be mentioned. On the right-hand side here, you see this inside this article panel. You have the normalized name uh, of the gene, so FMNL3 is the formula-like protein 3. You have the species, and then if you click on gene, you have the same thing for the gene, same thing for the antibodies. So I think this is a great feature because before you even read the article, you have the top three or top five genes, proteins, and antibodies. I mean, you know what this is about. You can carry on or you can just click on the gene and find uh, some latest research on it. Each of the genes and the proteins extracted become a search, uh, search capability for, for the engine as well. So if I click on this uh, F uh, formula like protein 3, you have three more links. So this is a great example of content, uh, content linking here. And uh, the links are quite different. Uniprot and Atrus gene are a database of proteins and gene. So if I click on one of those, I have this uh, pop-up window. So this is the delivery of uh, additional information in context, back to our example. And if I click on the uh, antibody uh, link, I go to a new product from Nature as well, recently launched, which is the Antibodypedia. So great uh, link here between a very structured product, uh, Antibodypedia from Nature, which of course needs uh, exposure because it's, it's a new product. And the goal is to route uh, the traffic from the journals to, uh, to this product. And this product is an e-commerce website that uh, drives leads uh, for providers of uh, antibodies. So the other way, of course, is to go directly on this product and do a search. Uh, but this is a great example of information in context. It's very likely that uh, if you check uh, the potential antibodies for a specific gene, you have an interest in, in buying them. So there is a good, uh, a good link here between a content-driven product and a data-driven a, a, a data uh, product. So that's Nature. I wanted to show you one more example uh, from Nature because we've mentioned it earlier, topic pages. Uh, so of course, in this example, this is interferon at nature.com. You have, uh, I mean, many more than, than this one. In this specific one, you know that your content is going to be very targeted to uh, those uh, readers interested in interferon because they carry this tag. What I did not mention is that you have a lot of ranking as well going on. So of course, they don't only mention interferon, but interferon is one of the key uh, a topic of uh, those articles. You have links to Nature Network, which are the discussion forums. So those discussion forums are contextual. I mean, they are relevant. They discuss interferon themselves. And you have links to Nature Jobs. And those jobs are for people who have an interest in interferon. And, and in many cases, they do mention this as well. So a good example of uh, aggregation, mashups of different, uh, different uh, sources. And a uh, typical example of content reuse, because of course, you have Notice that this uh, page is sponsored by PBL Interference Source. Uh, so, I mean, this is a high value sponsorship because those people here on this page, I mean, they have a very strong interest in, uh, in Interference, of course. For nature, it means that they can reuse journal contents, take a slice of it, put it into a topic page, it's fully automated, and get, uh, get advertising revenue. 
So the last one is from uh, Sage uh, Knowledge. And maybe I'll ask uh, John to uh, say, I, I mean, do the introduction to Sage Knowledge, explain, ex explain this uh, product. It's, it's fairly recent. Yeah, so at a, at a very basic level, it's an ebook platform uh, which has over 6,000 uh, books, reference works, um, and uh, uh, yeah, essentially books and reference works. Um, and what Guillaume is going to walk through is uh, implementation of metadata using the TMS technology, but how we could bring together um, relatedness across within the product, but uh, even outside of the product. Thanks, thanks, John. Uh, so this this product is uh, heavily enriched in terms of uh, metadata. I mean, there are, there are a lot of metadata uh, which which are already part of this of this product, and then on top of that, you have the semantic uh, metadata. So I will show you, uh, I mean, where where they're used. Uh, I mean, of course, you, you see the the table of content from matter chapter two, etc. So I mean, this is based on the structure of the XML itself, which is which is uh, I mean very well defined in this. Uh, in this product, uh, related keyword. This has been extracted by the system. So here we are on curriculum and instruction, and you see accreditation, uh, popular culture text, uh, alternative curriculum, etc. So you have uh, specific keywords. If you click, for example, on alternative curriculum, you go here to this new page. So you have 17 items which are very relevant, and they all carry this uh, semantic tag. You can use other metadata to refine. So you can look at your books, debates, dictionaries, encyclopedia, etc. So it's a good combination of metadata, which is on the one hand semantic, on the other hand that carries, that is carried by the, by the by the book chapters or the handbook in this uh, case. You can again refine uh, by subject, and you can oops, this one, and you can find uh, relevant um, uh, similar content as well. I have an example of the similar content here. Uh, if you're on curriculum and instruction, you can see the related title in Sage uh, knowledge. Thank you. Keep the questions for the end.